Well, the Chinese government has been trying hard to protect people's safety and the region's stability in Xinjiang is also facing tremendous skepticism and criticism from some Western countries for the so-called abuses of human rights, among other accusations. Two documentaries were released last week showing China's efforts to fight extremism and terrorism in Xinjiang, and these documentaries were aired on CGTN. You are watching a special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. Today I'll be looking at some clips from these documentaries, which include never-before-seen footages, to find out the bigger picture context and origin of the policies in Xinjiang. Joining me today in the studio are Professor Huo Zhengxin from the China University of Political Science and Law, and Professor Zhang Gong from the University of International Business and Economics. Now, I have to say, the footages uh, to be shown today could cause discomfort to some viewers. We advise viewer discretion. So the first piece of uh, footage we're going to show you will be um, footages of what happened on July the 5th in 2009 in a riot in Urumqi, the regional capital of Xinjiang. The riot left 197 people dead and over 1,700 people wounded. That's according to official accounts. And official estimates are believed to be much higher. The police have reviewed more evidence about the 2009 riots in Wumuji. Experts say the factors in the violence are complicated and have left wounds in the different ethnic groups. Some Western countries spread the idea that the 2009 Wumuji riots were ethnic clashes and repression. Chinese experts say that's illogical given the 911 attacks the anti-China interpretation shows the double standard adopted by some. Security outside the region has also been threatened. Let's take a look at the next one, what happened in the heart of China, uh, actually in the heart of China's capital, Beijing, where Xinjiang terrorists attacked at uh, Tiananmen Square. Um, on October the 28th, 2013, an SUV rammed through barricades in front of the Tiananmen Gate Tower and burst into flames. The attack killed two civilians and wounded over 40 people. The driver and the two passengers all died. On October 28th, 2013, an SUV rammed through barricades in front of the gate tower and burst into flames. The attack killed two civilians and wounded over 40. The driver and the two passengers all died. The authorities soon declared the incident a terrorist attack. They said it was not an isolated incident outside Xinjiang, and that it marked a new phase of terrorist violence. Terrorists from Xinjiang also attacked commuters in southwest China's Yunnan province at the Kunming railway station in March 2014, killing 31 people and wounding over 140. This security video shows how machete welding terrorists from Xinjiang attacked commuters in southwest China's Yunnan province at the Kunming railway station in March 2014. They killed 31 people and wounded over 140. And last uh, video we're going to show you also happened in 2014 on the same year. Uh, basically, just a, a month or so later, on May the 22nd, five terrorists rammed their vehicles into shoppers at a morning market in Xinjiang's regional capital, Urumqi, setting off explosives. They killed 39 people and wounded 94 others. Two months after the cleaning incident, Five terrorists ran their vehicles into shoppers at the morning market in Xinjiang's regional capital, Wumuji, setting off explosives. <coughs> they killed 39 people and wounded 94. Xinjiang 
So these are the four, um, sec um, four video footages I want to share with you. And uh, it's very heavy, right? I mean, when you see these kind of footages, we've heard uh, talk of how many terrorist attacks have happened in Xinjiang from the 1990s to 2016. But when you actually look at these footages, it makes you blood boil. I don't know how you're feeling about it, John. Well, it's very disheartening to see these scenes, uh, innocent people being targeted indiscriminately. I can't think of other word other than you know, terrorist attack to describe this. And I think it's actually more than terrorist attack. I think there's also a religious motivation behind it. Uh, I think uh, you know represents uh, essentially a you know extreme Islam's jihad against the Chinese nation. You know what they are trying to do is to uh, to, to secede from China to essentially establish a uh, you know ISIS type of caliph. I mean that's uh, that's their goal, and I think this is very uh, it has to be dealt with with force. Uh, I don't see any other way around this. Uh, have to be dealt with, and uh, um, fortunately, fortunately, I think uh, over the last few years, at least, I think the. Uh, the political situation in Xinjiang has been stabilized uh, very much due to you know, the, the, the Xinjiang government's uh, very forceful and very decisive uh, actions so far. Mm. Um, so, um, so I think uh, you know, these things um, haven't been widely uh, publicized before. Uh, I think it's a bit too late, but it, at least it's, you know, it's being broadcast right now. Uh, people in China, mm. lots of China, get to see what actually really happened in Xinjiang. Mm. Um, and, 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 I, and I think you know, it's, it's essentially a war. It's an unannounced war by these people against uh, the Chinese uh, people. Uh, and uh, it has to be, and if it's a war, it has to be dealt with in a war manner. Uh, so, uh, so I think um, you know, it's, uh, people are killing uh, people are like this, um, it, you know, it, you have to answer in a language they can understand. Hmm. Professor Huo, your first reaction upon seeing these footages, by the way, these are only the limited amount of footage that we are able to show, mm -hmm. and even in those documentaries, um, altogether it's uh, less than one hour's time, but as I said, thousands of terrorist attacks, sometimes every other day or every day there's something happening in that region. People could not go on their life in a you know, relaxed manner. People always had to have conting contingency plans. Students in schools always have to receive anti-terrorism drills yeah. because who knows what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. On a bus, the students were taught whenever they see a bag abandoned somewhere, mm -hmm. if after three times they ask whose bag it is, they should immediately throw it out of the bus because it happened in the past that somebody w could left some kind of explosive to kill innocent people like mm -hmm. that. So do you think, Professor Huo, that this kind of severity, the, extensi the, ex the extent of the, of the harm, of uh, the threat, was being widely known to the people in the West? Uh, frankly speaking, this is the first time that I see these bloody uh, you know, sceneries. I have to say I am uh, shocked, stunned, depressed. Uh, it is very depressing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think that these uh, terrorists the targets at civilians regardless of uh, the race, the religion or the gender. They are targeted against humanity. So I think I share his opinion uh, of the Professor Gong that they are not only the terrorism, they are, and they are the crimes against humanity. Mm -hmm. So I think that no government in such a situation could allow to, uh, you know, this kind of tragedy to continue to happen. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, I think that this justified the, the actions and measures taken by Chinese government. I think that is not only the rights of Chinese government, but the duty to the, of the Chinese government to take measures to prevent a citizen from terrorism and extremism. I think that the, uh, the right to, have us to, be, uh, to be safe, I think, is the most important human rights. Mm. Well, um, I was talking to someone from our group, from um, our program, actually. She was born in Xinjiang, and she go back from time to time. And um, according to her account, really, the fact that people can live their life in safety without the fear mm. of being blown up or, mm. you know, cut up, any moment is such a relief for a lot of people and of mm. course this has come at a heavy price mm. you know that a lot of people have to sacrifice their convenience or um, you know a lot of measures have to be put into place but 
ultimately people needed a sense of security in order to carry on their life and for the region to develop as well. Well, this is unfortunate. I mean, I guess uh, uh, at some point we pe decent people have to admit the um, the cost of democracy, the cost of civilization. You know, we have to bear these costs to deal with these people, uh, and uh, you know, it's a cost we have to bear. You know, some inconvenience on a lot of people. There's some uh, restriction on people's freedom in certain ways. Uh, but what alternatives do we have here, right? You know, I think at least um, containing people's, um, uh, uh, you know, quote, right or freedom in, in certain ways, at least is better than uh, uh, than people living not safe, risking being blown up. I guess so. Um, you know, it's a it's a it's a, it's a very difficult choice here, uh, and and we have to make that choice. Uh, uh, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, during during wartime, uh, you know, there are certain rules that we try to follow, but at other, other times that, uh, you know, sometimes we just have to make very tough choices. And sometimes it is too late when, mm -hmm. you know, a terrorist struck, mm -hmm. um, when people have already been killed or wounded, and then mm -hmm. you can hold these people, you can say these people are, are terrorists or convicted, but, you know, right. innocent lives already been taken right. or people have already been wounded. Right. Can is it, I think it's a, it's a challenge, it's a common challenge for humanity to find ways to prevent these things from happening in the first place. And right. that is a question for everybody, for every government. I don't think there is any effective means so yeah. far. Uh, we have seen so often that people who have been on watch list, for mm. instance, on, on, in Western countries, once they were taken off the watch list, Mm -hmm. Soon afterwards, they will be committing some kind of violence against innocent people. Yeah. So it, I think it's a, it's a common challenge, and China has been trying to find ways on that, right, Professor Huo? Yes, I agree that you know uh, terrorism. I think that is a, a consequence of multiple reasons. For example, the lack of education, including legal education, the lack of uh, job skills the isolation from the mainstream societies. So each government is trying to find a you know, comprehensive uh, approach to solve this problem. And I think that the Chinese government has you know, taken some preemptive measures to, you know, to educate these people to solve the deep-rooted causes of terrorism. I think it's an efficient way. I know that the, you know, since uh, 2016, there was no terrorist attack in Xinjiang. And after watching this footage, I, f I find that you know, these stabilities come not easily. No. And actually, if you look at the, what happened on Tiananmen Square mm -hmm. in that incident, you can understand that it's not just people in Xinjiang, basically also in Kunming, you know, in mm -hmm. another yeah, province. Right. Basically, it's not just in Xinjiang that people are affected. And by the way, not just Han people or Uyghur people, because everybody, mm -hmm. when the car was ramming into Right. You know, the shoppers right. in the morning market, right. they were indiscriminate in, right. the, in, the, in the kind of people they were killing. So it's not just in Xinjiang, it's not just any ethnic group, but it's, it's a, a larger target they're mm -hmm. aiming at. And right. so it's not just a regional issue either. I think that's what uh, that Tiananmen Square incident right. reminded uh, me. Well, absolutely. It's not just in Tiananmen Square, it's also that railway station in Kuomi. And I know that other places around China as well. Uh, reportedly, there are hundreds of these terrorist attacks that have happened in the last few years, the last 10 years. Um, and uh, um, it, you know, what, what we are doing in Xinjiang, in my opinion, um, is uh, from a you know, uh, outcome perspective, it's actually quite, quite effective, right? Um, well, whether, you know, it, it, it runs into some problems of procedural rules, for example, I mean, these things are debatable, but at least I think, uh, you know, it, the people are safer, right? And uh, if, if, as I said, if there's a way that people are, life are affected, their rights are affected, these are collateral damage that we just have to accept, right? I mean, we don't have an alternative here. Um, and, and the primary, as you said, the most important human rights is, is the existence, is people's life, right? So we have to pe save people's lives. So, um, so I, I, I don't have a problem with that. And I think I have a lot of problem with the Western press or the Western um, media uh, trying to criticize us, especially, you know, this bill in Congress, in the U.S. Congress right now. Mm. Um, you know, it's and just actually, very unfortunate. <coughs> and actually for a long time, these, what we saw, were not considered terrorist attacks. You know, they, they would say that the, the Uyghurs, they don't, on, on some Western media, they don't call these people terrorists. They, they used to call them militants, 
at worst, you know, or they think that they're not uh, trying to create terror. What they do is they're fighting back against, you know, ethnic or religious repression. That is the kind of narrative. No, do you think there's anything that no, can be justified? This, this is total nonsense. I mean, look at these people. They dress like ISIS guys. They dress in these robes. They're, with a black they're, 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 flag? They're, they're waving those, uh, it was this black flag. And they're waving these machetes. They're attacking people you know, indiscriminately. If I put these two footages in front of a, 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 a U.S. congressman, I, I, my guess is that he won't be able to distinguish this happening in Iraq, in, in Syria, or in Xinjiang. And, 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 you know, how can you distinguish these two, right? So um, it, it, that kind of argument is, is absolutely right. And if you look at what's happening on July 5th, uh, uh, that day in 2009, I call this ethnic cleansing. I mean, these are trying to ethnic cleansing Chinese hemp people out of Xinjiang. That's their objective. They're attacking people indiscriminately. They are, you know, they're, they're, they're killing people and they're murdering people indiscriminately, women and children included. So, you know, I I this is the exact the definition of ethnic cleansing, to my, in my opinion. Professor Hall? Well, as a law professor, I should say that the evidence speaks. So I think that the, the documentary released by CGT is very important because these uh, doc documentaries provide very concrete evidence to uh, let the whole world know that is what happened in, in Xinjiang. I think that this uh, satisfies all legal requirements uh, as a, a terrorism. So I think, as you, as you know, that there is Chinese saying which is uh, rumors uh, ends when transparency is there. Mm -hmm. So I think that this document, or I should say that the, that the evidence speaks. Uh, hopefully, hopefully. However, at this moment, uh, I have seen media reports where people who subscribe to CGTN did not get the recommendation of this documentary being aired. You mm -hmm. know, they don't understand what is being, what has happened to, mm -hmm. to the, you know, to YouTube, for instance, mm -hmm. when they are sub they subscribe to CGTN but they don't get this video mm -hmm. recommended to them. Actually, this 50, one of these two documentaries, the 50-minute one, has been taken off shelf oh, yeah. by YouTube, citing some kind of copyright reason mm -hmm. or whatsoever. So, it seems that there is an unwillingness for the international community, in the international community by some people to let these pictures spread further, spread wide. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is total hypocrisy. I guess, you know, there's a saying that a picture is worth a thousand words. Now we have an hour of uh, video footage here. It's, it's probably worth ten thousands of words and people are afraid. I mean, there's some people are certainly afraid of uh, showing this kind of a real evidence to, to the public. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they're, they're taking this off the shelf. But uh, uh, I think, you know, it, the, the news is going to out. I mean, they're going to, if there's a truth, there's no way you can stop the truth, okay? These are real facts. They're happening, right? Um, so, uh, so people are going to know this sooner or later. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. <coughs> another thing, another logic, which is beyond me, is that if people think that they are fighting for a just cause, mm -hmm. then they can use whatever means. Just like some people in Hong Kong, they believe, you know, they can achieve their just political aspiration even through breaking the law and here some, seems the same logic also applies because they're trying to repre uh, fight against repression from the Chinese government so these Uyghurs are allowed you know are tolerated to use violence to attract attention to call you know to, to gather support for their cause what do you what do you say to I that kind of logic? I think this argument is uh, groundless because you know everybody is equal before law you cannot uh, justify your uh, course by sacrificing the lives of others. Everybody should be protected by law. So I think it's groundless. Well, it seems that uh, sometimes when it comes to dealing with China or China-related stories, these uh, universal rules or logic doesn't seem to apply. Well, you have been watching a special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. We'll take a short break and we'll continue with more astonishing videos right after this. Stay with us. Welcome back with me here in the studio, Professor Huo Zheng Xin from China University of Political Science and Law and Professor Zhang Gong from the University of International Business and Economics. So uh, one of the documentaries we were talking about um, highlight or try to illuminate the connection between the East Turkestan Islamic Movement, a terrorist organization classified by the United Nations, and the separatist and the terrorist attacks in Xinjiang. So what is known as uh, ETIM, um, 
it has been uh, behind, it is believed to be behind the terrorist attacks in Xinjiang. And uh, uh, this documentary also highlighted how some members affiliated with this movement actually train, their, train kids to use weapon to commit violence. And sometimes they're training their own children. Take a look at this. This selfie video is from ETIM member Rosala Hong. Eventually, his son complies. The child in the video are Rose Lahongs. The boy who pulled the trigger was only six at the time. Yeah, so... Disgusting. Disgusting. It's sickening. Des despicable. Yeah. It's, I, I don't know how to, what to say after watching this kind of thing, John. Yeah, it's just it's disgusting, you know. Uh, As a mother... You, you cannot get lower yeah. than that. I mean, they are... Um, Ruin their own people, they are ruining their own children. Uh, you can only find these people in ISIS. You know, actually, um, the um, actually there are people from Xinjiang uh, who are fighting for the ISIS cause in Syria and Iraq, being caught uh, by by the uh, the Allied force there. Uh, and uh, uh, so there's a proven connection between ETM and ISIS. Uh, they are the same group, uh, sharing the same philosophy, sharing the same extreme religious belief, mm. uh, and they're together. Yeah. Um, Professor Ho, from a legal perspective, uh, how, would you dis how would you characterize what that man was doing to his own children? I'm, I'm really surprised because, you know, this man is destroying his own sons. The boys, they cried. They are reluctant to pull triggers, but they have to do their father's orders, and they cried. I should say that it's, uh, well, from the perspective of law, I should say that it's entirely against domestic Chinese law and also it violates international law, the UN conventions on the rights of child. So I think it's a crime, not only you know, violates Chinese law, but also international humanitarian law. So, so we have people like this you know, roaming the streets. Maybe not everybody is to this degree, but you don't know. And you, uh, what does that say about the power of indoctrination, of radicalization for some people, especially when a lot of the, the social context is that a lot of these people uh, actually never got proper education. They don't mm -hmm. have a job. They don't have work. Mm -hmm. They're not working. You mm -hmm. know, so they basically a blank piece of paper, which easily make them prone to radicalization influence. So, explain a little bit of the kind of social context we're looking. Yeah, I think that uh, young and, under, and and to understand the harm of radicalization for this father and for his children. Yes, I think that this uh, story tells that even the child is also maybe the victim of the direct de radicalization, and you really the young people of radicalization. Yeah, radicalization. Yeah, and so I think that this also uh, m manifests that education is very important. The education towards young people, even to the minors, are extremely important. Otherwise, they will be, be you know, brainwashed. They will be influenced for the whole life. This will this will destroy their lives. So I think these all justify the measures that are taken by the Chinese government. They are the pre pre preventing measures. They are very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you if you leave it up to them, nobody would say yes. I have a problem. Help me. You know, nobody would commit to commit themselves right. to any any of. They wouldn't. They wouldn't realize that they have right. been poisoned by. I, yeah, I think uh, joblessness and poverty and you know lack of economic prospect have play a certain role in this, but I think at a more fundamental level, uh, these are not the only reasons. I think it has a lot to do with the uh, extreme religious, uh, extreme Islamic uh, inculcation uh, to these people, uh, intoxication of these people. 
uh, you know, when, when you have this kind of a very extreme version of Islam um, taught to these people uh, at a very young age, they're actually quite easy to be swayed, to be swindled into this belief. Um, and uh, um, so uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult to change people's mind, even though, uh, you know, they're, they're better educated. I mean, yeah, I mean, look at the, some of the leaders within the ISIS movement. Some of, the, some of these people are from quite wealthy families. Some of these people are quite well educated, right? So I think it's more than just an issue of uh, uh, economic uh, situation. I think it uh, also has a lot to do with the very fact that this extreme uh, Islamic religious belief is something very intoxicating and it's something very, um, very harmful to society. It, it just doesn't resonate well with today's uh, civilization now. Is or are the Western countries immune from the harm of what we are seeing. No, of course they are and not. The, the, the way how they're arguing, yeah, the yeah. way how they're arguing against China's grave effort in trying to turn things around sounds as if, you know, it is in their interest that everybody's rights is protected to the full, even if they can be potentially very harmful to the society. I, I would I would put a big, big equation mark between what's happening in Xinjiang and what happened to these Twin Towers in New York City? They are the same thing. They are attacked by the same kind of people, okay? Now, you know, I remember this very famous phrase from George Bush, President Bush. He said, you are either with us or against us, right? So, you know, China was, was with the United States when, when the Twin Towers were blown up. China was 100% right. supportive right. of the United States' effort to go after these terrorists, to go after bin Laden, right? Now we are doing the same thing now. We are going after these terrorists. We are trying to uh, you know, save Xinjiang from, from, from the spread of terrorism. And now you know, the United States is passing this law. Uh, and, it's, and I think in, in a very sense it's basically you know, providing some support, moral support to these people and providing a free pass to these people. People who are radicalized could also threaten U.S. targets yes, of as course. well. I think uh, what happened in the U.S. in one of the naval bases just the other day, right? Yes, yes. yes. keep going. Just I, keep I, going. I think <coughs> just a, a couple of weeks ago, London, there were also some terrorist attacks. So I think mm -hmm. that extremism and uh, terrorism are the common enemy to the whole world. So I think that every country, the international community, should cooperate each other to fight terrorism and religious uh, extremism. You know, what I find disheartening is when I talk to my foreign colleagues and sometimes they would say, you know what, I'd rather risk being attacked than have my freedom taken away. You know, <laughs> when send, you have... Send them to Xinjiang. Very simple. Send them... I, I wish this... When people say these things, I wish them they were living in the Twin Towers when these things are brought up. I mean, this is... I apologize for saying this, but this is... But a lot of people actually probably really share this kind of thought, you know, and I find it really frustrating that I can't argue with them. Um, you, you know this, this American professor from University of Colorado by the name of Churchill, he was saying sort of these things and he was widely, widely condemned yeah. in the United States during those years. All right. I have to leave it there. Many thanks to Professor Huo Zhengqing from China University of Political Science and Law and uh, Zhang Gong from University of International Business and Economics. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of The Point with me, Lucian. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle The Point with Alex. Thanks for watching. You've got the point.